Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Club Metaverse podcast. Today, I am joined by perhaps my favorite working, living author um, on the planet Earth today, Mr. Andy Weir, author of The Martian. And I say that you're my favorite, but I actually haven't read the second book yet, and all my friends rag on me about it every single day. Uh, but uh, it's called Hail Mary Full of Grace, correct? Uh, well, it's called Project Hail Mary. Project Hail Mary. Project Hail Mary. Yeah. Um, and I haven't gotten around to it yet. And I'm almost savoring it like like a fine wine, but which is which is not a great by, thing because by I'm, allowing it to age for several decades <laughs> before you open it, yeah, right. that makes sense, <laughs> right? But um, you know, um, Andy's such a fascinating character because Andy um, is a computer engineer by trade, or that's how you kind of got started uh, professionally. His father is a physicist. Um, and while he wrote this masterpiece of thought experiment in The Martian, you had a full-time job. And, and my first question is, are you? do you still have that job working as an Android developer, or is that long gone now? That's long gone now, but it. Uh, I mean, I hung on to it for a long time because I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, for those uh, viewing at home, that's my dog, Coco, in the background. You may see him from time to time. What He's, up, Coco? Uh, He's he's just uh, he's wandering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's he's got important dog things to deal with, and he's yeah. He seems like he's conscious of his environment, though. Though you know, like uh, the blind thing doesn't seem to be affecting him too badly. Yeah, I mean, right. Well, he doesn't spend a lot of time in my office. Usually, he's in the family room. But mm. uh, today is sort of a special case because we're having some renovation done on the kitchen. He doesn't like the noise, so now he's kind of exploring in his blind dog way, which is basically doing the movement algorithm of a Roomba. <laughs> Just walk until you hit something, then turn, and then try well, again. So have you actually mathematically like put all the points on the floor and compared them to the Roomba movement? Is there some similarities? No, no, I haven't done that, but I guarantee you it would be pretty much that. Like if you if you watch, he he oh well you can't see him right now, but yeah. he'll basically he'll just go in a straight line until he hits something. <laughs> right, right, right. That's, That's okay. the modifier. That's the modifier. But, but in answer to your actual question, yes. Um, no, I no longer uh, am an engineer. I was a software engineer for 25 years. So the last job I did, the last few jobs I did was Android development. Then before that was uh, PC and Mac development mm. and 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 oh, oh actually in the middle there there was smartphone and even feature phone development before android and ios existed mm. but i actually i really liked that job i've always liked being an engineer i mean people have this uh this notion of the sad bleak cubicle dweller like oh it's dilbert we're all miserable and mm. i liked it i like <laughs> <laughs> I was a happy little cog. I liked being a cubicle dweller. I liked, I, I, one of the biggest things I miss about it is being part of a team, you know, because, yeah. you, you know, there'd be myself and then maybe five or six other engineers and then, you know, three or four dedicated QA and then, of course, a project manager and everything. We're all part of a team. We're all working together to make a product happen. Right. And that felt good. I liked being part of a team. Oh, uh, oh and. When you're a writer, you're all by yourself. <laughs> I mean, you have you have your editor that you're working with later on in the project, but when you're writing that first draft, which is the hardest part of a book, mm -hmm. you're you're all by yourself. You know, one one thing that about you that I think is absolutely fascinating is that you you use your your sort of software engineering um, skill set to actually help you you know, uh, facilitate your writing process and specifically with, with the Martian, how you created your own software model to accurately predict the trajectory of, of the Aries and, 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 and its mission to Mars and what they would get there and its trajectory so that you had this kind of visual reference grounded in mathematics to help you out. Do, do you kind of make a practice out of trying to create some kind of simulation technology that sort of helps your storytelling outline? Well, um, I wouldn't say I go out of my way to do simulations, um, but I do go out of my way to get the physics and, and science as accurate as possible. <laughs> Coco just barely sneaking into frame there. <laughs> right, He's like, just, right. like, if I just turn it just a little bit. See, there is he is. Oh, there she is. There she is. There she is. <laughs> He's a boy. I know you. You. Oh, there you, you he said is. There she. he is. Yeah, he, yeah, he, he, he uses a he him pronouns. 
he, um, him, he, him. I, my apologies. Also, he is a boy. Everyone assumes that Coco is like for Coco Chanel, but right. it's Coco like the drink, like C O C O A. Right. Well, anyway, he's roombying in the background. Um, I apologize. I I'm one of those dog people, so it's oh, very yeah. easy for me to go off on dog related tangents. Um, As am I. We can go off on dog related <laughs> tangents all all you want. So, um, uh, but seriously, trying trying hard to stay focused on your question. <laughs> um, I am really focused on getting the science right. Like I really want mm -hmm. the science to be accurate and correct as much as I possibly can. Yeah, I I break the rules here and there on purpose and with full you know knowledge, first degree science breakage. But um, I do that when I when I decided well in advance that I need to do that to advance the plot. Mm -hmm. But um, so in the case of the Martian, when I was working on the, the, the trajectories, Hermes, that's the ship that took them back and forth between Mars. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, a, an ion thrusting ship. It has an acceleration of about, I think, two millimeters per second per second. Mm. That's what its ion drives can do. And so I'm like, how do you calculate those orbital trajectories? And I, looked for the math and science online, couldn't find any answers. So I'm like, well, what does NASA do? And I found out NASA just does simulation. Right. So I'm like, all right, I wrote an app to, I actually wrote an app to help me create the, the trajectories. And then I'm like, okay, that kind of works, that kind of works, that kind of works. And then I came up with the Rich Purnell maneuver. Yeah. Uh, so, so let me ask you a question. Do you do this in like Java and C plus plus? What what programming language do you feel the most comfortable with? Uh C plus uh, yeah, plus is the one awesome, I feel most dude. comfortable in. I, I spent a lot of time uh, doing Java in my um, in work, but uh, for me, uh, it's just easiest to go straight to C plus plus, especially when I'm going to be really computationally. Well, nowadays it doesn't matter with jitting, but um, right. used to be used to be writing, you know, code that ran natively ran a lot faster. There's yeah. a lot of computation involved in the in the orbital trajectory stuff. Although I'm sure a Java app would have would have been able to blow through it just as easily. Yeah, because I am. Um, so, you know, part of my business is that I have a VR, um, you know, development studio and we publish games currently for Steam and Oculus Quest or Meta Quest, whatever they're calling themselves these days. Um, and, you know, we use the Unreal Engine as our sort of underlying rendering technology. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's like that's like the last one that runs on C++. Like mm -hmm. everything else has migrated to either Java or C sharp or or whatever it is. Well, yeah, that's because um, the major engines they what what they've really done, I think, is their interface is Java or C sharp or whatever else. But deep down, the 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 the, the hard work, the 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 nitty gritty is being done natively. I'm sure. And, and like this is a question that people are going to say, why the hell are you asking him this? But I want to ask you because this is because you're an engineer. What what's a kind kind of a simple articulation of the differences between C plus plus and C sharp? Like as somebody who just runs the team, I don't actually get in the weeds on uh, it, but I but I struggle to find C plus plus developers. Like like really? it's a dying art form. It's a bit of a dying uh, art form. No, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, my favorite. I know. I know. Um, well, C sharp is another. Uh, C sharp is a runtime interpreted language, whereas C plus like like Java. Uh, whereas C++ is is compiled directly into native machine code. Oh, and um, C Sharp is also, um, uh, it's 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 got a very different, uh, I, 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 I hated it, um, but mm -hmm. it, it, it is compatible with, I think, ANSI C, with straight C. Mm -hmm. Maybe with C++, but I, it's, it's definitely compatible with straight C. Because the first thing I would do when doing, for instance, iOS games, that was Coco saying hi, um, <laughs> When I'm making an iOS game, for Which instance. Which you do? You make iOS games? Not now, but I did when I was an engineer. Okay, gotcha, um, gotcha. Uh, iOS's interface is all, uh, for, for making native games, is all C-sharp. And so the first thing I do was make an interface layer to, like, to wrap all of the C-sharp functionality I needed in straight C calls. And then the rest of my app was all in C++ and I'd call into those straight C calls as needed or those straight C calls would call into now, me. Now, um, so but that's just my old fossil way of doing things. You know, C what, Sharp what, also has very strange, in my opinion, mm -hmm. calling conventions, the way the uh, function definitions work. Yeah, because like C Sharp is like, you know, it's the language, as I'm sure you know, that they use in Unity, which has become a very, very popular, uh, you know, rendering uh, platform. And 
and mm. and it's the easiest one to hire for. Uh, folks have the most experience with that, you know. And but mm. my all my products are based on C plus plus because I work with a lot of studios and a lot of brands and and a lot of their native assets that they're doing their special effects work with is also an unreal. So it's becoming extremely easy for me to share assets with my brand partners, you know, which right. is like, which is this fascinating element of it. Right. Well, one of the main benefits, I guess, to C sharp is that if you already know C or C plus plus, it's not that hard to learn it. Interesting. But I mean, the same can be said about Java and I, I like Java a lot. Hang on one moment. I've no worries. No worries. Dog in my lap. <laughs> all, all good, man. Do what. My special needs dog has some special needs. He needs, needs so, to know that I'm here. Um, so um, let me ask you a crazy question. And I apologize. I'm sure that this is not the uh, the standard line of questioning that you get, but do you, if you wanted to make a full on simulate, cause this is my obsession in life is to create virtual reality simulations. I have a studio, 15 developers, 10 artists, you know, and, and we do games, you know, for the studios um, and for myself, if I wanted to make a scientifically or, or a Andy Weir accurate simulation of the Hermes, do you know all of the flight models and all of the systems that actually would need to be engineered inside the software for it to actually function one for one, like the ship would? Um, well, uh, I mean, I certainly everything related to the navigational characteristics, mm. like its size, its shape, its mass, its acceleration, the ion engines, its energy consumption, all that stuff like that. But if you get into the nitty gritty of like the internal layout or exactly how the life support system works or you know, stuff like that, I, I wouldn't be able to. <laughs> right, right, right. It'd take you some time, but like, like what, what of my kind of look and always, this is what you start thinking about when you, you know, when you think of your heroes is that for me, I think that you sit in a room and you put yourself in these incredible sort of thought experiment zones where you're like, what, yeah, that's what's the fun part. Yeah, like what's gonna like 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 how do I turn the thing on? You know, like 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 you know how how does the you know how does the battery system work? How does the lighting system work? You know, well the like, first thing you do, well Hermes, the first thing you do is you'd have to. Uh, it would take quite a while to turn on. It's powered by a reactor, so mm. you'd have to uh, activate a nuclear reactor that's in the spine, the core of the ship. The Hermes that was in the book is nothing like what you saw in the movie. The one you saw in the movie was, um, you know, very spacious, very large, plenty of room and everything like that. Sure. Um, in, uh, in, in the book, it's actually like it's it's a much larger uh, it, it's OK. It's got two configurations. Mm -hmm. It's got its arrow breaking configuration where it looks basically like an Apollo reentry capsule. It's basically a cone. OK. Right. But much, much bigger than the Apollo capsule, but still an Apollo reentry capsule style thing with a um, with, with a heat shield at the bottom. And that's how it would use aero braking at Mars to help slow down. Mm -hmm. And then and also at Earth when it came back. And then also then its flight configuration is where that uh, cone breaks into two halves that separate out the center of the ship. So the the. Um, the uh, the the heat shield is all one solid piece, and then it has like this uh, central um, hub that goes from the heat shield all the way up to the front of the ship, mm -hmm. and then the two halves of the cone separate out on cables, uh, and then the whole thing spins to provide artificial gravity during the flight configuration. Wow. So that the crew won't get muscle atrophy. Has this been visualized? Like, do you have fans that have actually drawn the no. Hermes from the book? No, uh, I mean, I drew it and stuff like that. But um, I haven't had fans that drew the Hermes from the book just because. First off, I didn't. I didn't go too into the weeds describing the Hermes because the interesting stuff was happening on on Mars, not sure, sure, not sure, aboard sure. the ship. But um, yeah, and so uh, in answer to your question, how you turn it on? Well, in that central spinal area is that's where the reactor is. And then the Hermes itself also has just um, in, in its flight configuration, it has like a bunch of um, 
radiators, basically mm. heat, heat radiation. Um, cause that's reactors work by creating a large heat gradient. You use nuclear right. reactions to make hot. And then usually like on earth, a, a reactor will be near a body of water where you can use sure. the water as the heat gradient. And, and then that that's how you end up powering things, uh, for when you're in space, getting rid of the heat is hard. So you need to radiate it out with black body radiation. But I also worked out that, um, you don't need as much of that as you might think. So mm. the thermal thermal radiators aren't even that big a part of the ship. And was Hermes launched in one single unit or was it built in space? It was built in space bit by bit over a long period of time. Got it. And then it was built in space. Um, With the intention of being used for all five manned or crewed Mars missions. Um, so missions would come and go. They'd have... They, you know, you needed fresh, uh, you needed a new MDV and a new MAV for every mission, new crew, new supplies, all sorts of, you know, repairs and stuff to Hermes. But Hermes itself was used for the entire Ares program. And then um, the 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 actual station in on Mars that you guys set up with the five different unmanned missions um, to sort of prep everything up at the station. So that's uh, that's different. So uh, the, um, so the, the the mission profile is first. You know they made the Hermes, and that was like a very big uh, task. Um, uh, but unrelated to that, for each Ares mission, they would do pre-supplies. Mm -hmm. That has nothing to do with Hermes. Hermes isn't involved in that. They would sure. send pre-supply missions, so just unmanned probes to Mars, and they would all land at the eventual um, landing site base for where the humans are going to be. And the base so, was called what again? I'm sorry, I forget. It did uh, just Ares three? It didn't have a. It didn't. The have MAV a name. or something. Oh, okay. To... Yeah. So the MAV is the Mars ascent vehicle. They oh, okay, also okay. send that in advance. That's it. the. It's the MAV's sole purpose in life is to get the astronauts from the surface of Mars back up to Hermes after their mission is done. Got it. Hermes carries with it the MDV, which is the Mars descent vehicle. And its sole job is to land the, the astronauts on Mars. And that stays beginning. on Mars. That's not that coming stays back. on Mars. Yeah. Right. The MAV is sent something like 18 or sent to land or something like 18 months before the astronauts even launch. Mm -hmm. And that is, and it lands there and then slowly makes its own fuel. Mm -hmm. um, it brings enough hydrogen uh, to make a bunch of methane. There's not a lot of hydrogen. Well, actually now we know there are actually plenty of hydrogen on Mars, but at the time I wrote the book, we didn't know that. <laughs> um, so within the fiction of the story, it brings enough hydrogen and then uses just carbon dioxide in Mars's atmosphere. And that plus energy, which it would get with solar power. Um, um, actually, I think, it, uh, no, no, it was powered by an RTG. Um, a radio thermographic, a radio thermoelectric generator, radioactive, whatever. It's the same thing that powers like Curiosity, for instance. Mm. Um, using that energy, it would just very slowly over time do uh, what's called the Sabatier reaction, which turns hydrogen and carbon dioxide into methane and oh, and and oxygen. That's awesome. I... And then so then so it's just doing that to fill up its fuel tanks. Um. Yeah, that's that because you know for me my my kind of deep fascination is um, ha have you ever used VR before like like as a fellow gamer I'm assuming that maybe I mean a little bit yeah okay yeah. so so you know I've been in the video game industry for a long time I was one of the early uh, employees at Rockstar Games you know oh. have have credits as a writer director on Grand Theft Auto Vice City Midnight Club then I was a creative director at Atari and like. You know, like I've been in the video game industry pretty much my entire professional life. Um, and I've also been in media, right? So I have this combo of media and gaming. Um, and after I put on the headset, I haven't been able to go back to flat screen. And, and, and like I've been obsessed with this idea that, you know, the, the VR headset, the, the, like the big difference for me between VR and flat screen is that VR kind of puts your brain in like memory mode, like it feels like a memory when you play a VR experience versus a game that feels like you're 
consuming some kind of media format, right? Whether it's television or or a movie, you have the experience, but it doesn't feel like a memory. If if that makes any sense. Yeah, I think it makes sense because um, when you're doing VR, you're actually using parts of your brain that you're not using when you're looking at a screen. When you're looking at a screen, you're seeing a two-dimensional image that you are through intellect um, interpreting to have meaning. Yeah. Um, like a lot of uh, animals, for instance, can't, like if they see a 2D image, they see moving lights and colors, but they don't identify it as, oh, this is a representation of the 3D world elsewhere. Whereas um, when you put on a VR helmet, it goes straight into your, um, there's large portions of your brain dedicated to just understanding your 3D environment that you're in, if knowing where things are and like, oh, okay, like, you know, I, I glanced around the room. So right. now my brain just knows behind me back there, there's a desk. You know, right. even if I'd never been in this room before, there's a desk. Might not remember all the details, but there's a thing there. And if sure. I was going to back up, I would know to avoid the thing and yeah. so on. And so these are all sub processes that are in your brain that are automatic based on your vision input. Mm. And so I guess with a VR headset, you're getting that. And so your brain is processing it as if it directly processing directly processing it as if it was the real world, as opposed to taking visual input, running it through your cognitive mind. Sure. And then having your cognitive mind use your imagination to create a world. So yeah, it just yeah. kind of bypasses those steps. Um, it's an interesting thing, a random aside here, is um, the way your brain understands its 3D environment is something so deep down that you don't even know that it's happening. Mm. There's um, so the uh, the information from your eyes actually gets split uh, on the way into your brain. It gets it splits off into a completely different part of your like your lizard brain, and mm. then the rest of it goes to your occipital cortex. Occipital cortex does all the vision stuff that you know of. Like you're like, oh, okay, I get it. That's vision. But another part goes to your like lizard brain. And that's the part that, like, it just processes, like, at, in a completely different way, processes the data. And its sole job is to say, this, these are where things are in the 3D environment. Wow, that's fascinating. Because So, well, no, this gets way more interesting. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, you no, can no, always cut this out. If it's boring, you can cut no, it no, out. No, 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 this like is a, the good stuff. This yeah. is the good stuff. Yeah. And so um, there are people who through misfortune have had damage to their occipital cortex, maybe by a bilateral stroke oh, okay. or who have been, who have had physical damage to their head or whatever that are what they call cortically blind. And what that means is their eyes work perfectly well, but the part of their brain that processes vision input is, is dead or inactive because mm. of uh, trauma, accident, stroke, whatever. And so that makes them cortically blind so they can't see anything. You say, what do you see? They say, nothing. You know, you're blind. You see absolutely nothing, right? But if you tell them to walk down a hallway with obstacles, they will avoid all the obstacles. Wow. And then you say, like, so you just walk down a hallway and you avoided all the obstacles. And they'll be like, I don't, I don't think so. And they're like, yeah, you did. You, 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 you avoided all the obstacles. And they're like, well, you just, you know, I, that just felt like, the way to go down the hallway they you can't they can't even explain why they chose the path they chose wow. because it's so deep in your lizard brain it doesn't even it doesn't even notify your rational mind right because like the the lizard brain at the very very beginning like all it could do was sense if I go up in the water, it's brighter. If I go down in the water, it's darker, right? Like That's like, a little further back than the lizard brain, but yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. But, yeah. <laughs> but the, the, the lizard brain, I mean, it does a lot of critical things, but also in terms of cognition, or if you even call it that, it's all about just stimulus response. So right. you don't, you, you're, you're, you, the parts of your brain that are you, the parts that are your personality, that your thought processes and stuff like that, you don't really have access to all that shit. You, yeah. you, you, you don't talk to your lizard, your, your main brain doesn't talk to your lizard brain and say, tell me about the 3D environment. No, it's like a, it's like a, in, in coding terms, it's like a black box library with just some, with some various interface functions. That's it. And your right. brain, your brain just says like, I want to get from here to there. And the lizard brain goes, here's your path. Right, and right. Your brain right. goes, hey, why? 
and and you know why why are we taking that path and the lizard brain goes yeah bite me that's why just here's your path yeah so so do you have any kind of ambition because obviously you have a history of making games and i i I definitely want to chat about that a little bit and you're a brilliant writer um thanks that that sounds like it kind of came out of nowhere kind of like not out of nowhere because i know your story of having your mailing list and and publishing your short stories and building up this kind of organic fan base over time which is a beautiful, you know, beautiful story in and of itself. Um, but do you ever dream about kind of combining these two things again and creating simulation experiences in VR or games again? No, not really, because I, I, I like narrative fiction. I like to tell the story. Um, I found out, uh, yeah, I storytelling is very different than providing an experience where the, where the user runs the show. Mm-hmm. Um, so one thing I found out is that like, um, when I would play role-playing games with my friends, mm-hmm. I, I would, I would be pretty good at making immersive worlds with like, you know, I was oh, I good imagine. at the world building and stuff <laughs> like that, but I wasn't that good a GM because like, I'm like, oh, this would be awesome. This sequence of events is a great story, right. but the players might just go, oh, I'm going this way, this way, this way. And, and so they don't cooperate because in the end, like role playing games are a collaborative storytelling in a in a roundabout way, and sure. that's not how writers really want to write. You know, right. writers We're, like no, no, no. The cool stuff is if everybody does this exact thing and keep you on rails, right. which makes right. me kind of a bad GM. And so, as that, I've never, uh, I, I've never had much interest in being a game designer. Mm. I, I enjoy the process. I, I like the problem solving when people would say like, "Here's the game design." make it happen i'll be like right 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 right, 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 right. no that but the um, building side of it more than yeah. the actual because like the not the creative that, the building yeah or, when, or the when i was or, yeah. when, when i was back at rockstar um one of the most creative humans i've ever met um my boss the the guy the president of rockstar at the time his name was sam hauser um we we kind of created this thing that we were very proud of and we called it systemic storytelling where, where you would build a series of systems inside of a larger system, and these systems would interact with each other and with the player, and it would create these kind of emergent narratives where every single player experienced a slightly different narrative, but guided with these kind of systems that were tailored to create a kind of experience, you know? And it's a different mode of storytelling for sure, um, but I think. Um, you know, it's just another challenge, right? It's another medium. It's like the sonnet evolved into this, evolved into that. And, and like, I think, you know, for me, video games are way closer to novels than they are to like screenplays or like movies, for example, right? That's interesting because in all cases of fiction, um, novels, screenplays, movies, television, whatever, um, it's still a, a storyline that the consumer has absolutely no control over. Sure. Like when you're reading a book, you can't control the outcome of no, what but, happens. No, but but unless to, it's a choose your own adventure book. <laughs> right, right, right. But 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 to disagree with that for a second, they can control the series of events that are unfolding before them, but the user can definitely control the visualization of those events. True. Yeah, and, they can and, control what they're seeing in their mind's eye. Right. And that within and of itself is half the fun of reading a book, right? Like when you read a book, the way that it looks like to me and the way that it looks like to somebody else, no matter how good your description is, is going to be completely different, you know? And that, yeah, um, that's why actually one of my tips for one, one of the rules that I follow in writing and a tip I give to any prospective writers is don't, mm-hmm. don't physically describe your characters in, unless it's salient to the plot. Mm. Like I don't even I generally don't even tell the ethnicity of a character. Sure. Like you if you if you want him to be black, he's black. You just whatever whatever you want to see in your mind's eye. Cuz one thing that I've found as a reader is it drives me mm. crazy when I get an image in my mind of what a character looks like and then the book comes and tells me, "Oh, by the way, yeah, he had like long curly hair yeah, yeah that's I'm like what point. i i had him with a crop top in my head now am i going <laughs> right. to correct that in my right, right i've got right. to go back and correct that in my mind no 
And so what I do is like, if a, you know, if a character has a feature or trait, a physical trait that is relevant to the story, then I'll make sure that that comes across pretty quickly so that the reader doesn't have to correct their mind's eye. But beyond that, I try not to do anything. Yeah, like yeah, no. My second book, uh, you had said Project Hail Mary was my second book. It's actually my third. My second book is uh, like uh, wasn't as popular as The Martian. It did okay. It was called Artemis. Mm. And the main character in that is a uh, a woman who is uh, a, well of Saudi descent. Mm. Actually, she was born in Saudi Arabia too, but she lives on the moon. <laughs> but um, anyway, so it's relevant. Uh, her personality, her character, her relationship with her father, that's all relevant to her cultural background. So it was relevant that the reader understands she's Saudi. Sure, and, sure. And, and so I made sure to get that across, you know, early before people started forming a picture in their mind of what she might look like. But, and, and without without any spoiler, man, because I'm really looking forward to this once things in my life relax a little bit mm -hmm. uh, and maybe I take my next long trip. Um, because like once I picked up the Martian, I couldn't put it down. And, and like the thing about me and the Martian that I think really captured me is that, yes, it has all this crazy science stuff that I'm super interested in as a fanboy. I'm like a total <laughs> dork when it comes to that stuff. And like I've interviewed on this channel, Avi Loeb and, you know, uh, uh, Lo you know, Lawrence Krauss and Brian Green, you know, like I'm fascinated with this physics stuff, you know, mm -hmm. but what really kind of got me about it was the language of of the narrator felt like I was like reading maybe something more along the lines of like a cross between Jack Kerouac and Neil Stevenson. Like there was a certain humanity to the narrator that didn't like really make me question my own knowledge of physics, you know? And, and, and like, how does a computer engineer like end up with that kind of touch um, well, uh, by spending my whole life also writing, like, right, um, right. I mean, I wrote, uh, I wrote, uh, two full length novels before the Martian that no one's ever seen because they suck. Um, everybody's <laughs> I, I first that, book, but... <laughs> no, but everybody's first book sucks. In my, in my case, my second book also sucked, but the Martian <laughs> did well. And also I was writing short stories and stuff. I've been writing since I was a, a, a I, not even teen, tween, since I was like, you know, 11 or 12, I've been wow. writing stuff. And so I've always been into it. And in fact, when I went to college, I was, I kind of deliberated. I, computer science was new because I'm really old. Um, <laughs> in fact, I'm yeah. 50 now. Oh, um, well, you and I are in the same generation. We're both Gen Xers. Gen X. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yep. The, the forgotten generation. While right. the boomers <laughs> and millennials are being assholes to each other, we're just like, yeah, yeah, we're I still here. Yeah, don't mind Gen us. X is the last great, you know, generation. But. Oh, is that so? <laughs> I have no particular pride in my generation, but I, <laughs> right, right. I, I, but, but I, I, you know, anyway, um, I, I'm not ashamed of it either. <laughs> so, you, so you were born in '72. '72 is correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just like my brother. My brother's '72. My business partner Mark Echo is also '72. So and how about I'm you? I'm '76. I'm '76. Oh yes, Sprout. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so yes, I'm proud to say I was born just before the last Apollo mission. So when I was mm. six months old is when Apollo 17 happened. Oh, okay. And, nice. and so I, I, at one point during my life, there were people on the moon. Right. You know, like, like, like while you were alive, there were people. While, while people. I was alive and on this earth, there right. were people on the moon. Yes, yes. I mean, I was six months old, so while they were walking on the moon, I wasn't walking at all. Right. Or, <laughs> or in Stanley Kubrick's soundstage in. Uh, or in yes, well, well, yes. While I was six months old, <laughs> NASA was faking the Apollo seventeen mission, <laughs> which I don't believe, by the way. I I, I know I, you don't. I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. Uh, but, um, but but I'm sorry because I'm really fascinated wake up, about sheeple. This. Um, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> so, uh, so you were talking about how you developed your writing style because it's yeah. man, it's just it's, tons and tons like, of practice. It's like, it's like anything butter. else. Thank it's you. It's like butter. It's like um, butter. What, well, for the Martian, I realized that it was um, going to be very science intensive. Right? There's going to be a lot of real science in it. That's the approach I was doing at the time I was writing it. It was sort of a. It was just a, a labor of love. I was posting the chapters to my website as I wrote them, and so I thought. My target audience was a tiny, tiny niche 
of mm. hardcore nerds who wanted to see the math. Right. I had no right. suspicion it would have any mainstream appeal at all. So I was like, all right, I'm going to show the math. But also I wanted it to be interesting. <laughs> I didn't want it to read like a Wikipedia article. Now, personally, I like just reading Wikipedia articles, but <laughs> most people don't want to curl up with a nice Wikipedia article before bed. And so I said, how do I get a bunch of technical information across without boring the hell out of the reader? And the answer is humor. The reader will forgive you any amount of exposition if you make them laugh while you're giving it to them. Yeah. And, and, and like the fan is like the like like the fascinating thing is, is that, you know, there's a lot of people that kind of enjoy being by themselves and. And there's some upside to being by yourself, right? You're like within your own thoughts. You, you're you really comfortable with your inner dialogue and all this kind of stuff. And with The Martian, like that's the thing that really captured me was that this inner monologue um, that our main character is going through, it, it, it's incredibly engaging that of what you would expect of somebody in an extreme isolation stage to create that level of, of humanity inside his own head so he can cope with the fact that he's completely alone. Sure. Um, yeah. Well, Mark, I wanted him, I mean, he came, he comes across as just like a guy that you'd like to have a beer with. Right. Exactly. But also, you know, he's not a normal person. He, he probably beat out 10,000 other extremely qualified people for this seat on a mission to Mars. Right. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's, He's not just a normal guy. He can handle incredible stresses and pressures mm -hmm. with without losing his shit. And so that's part of the reason I made him like that is um, so that he could handle it. Also, uh, it is, although he's ha he has some pretty serious stuff going on, it is a lighthearted kind of story. It's, 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 it's light. It's not like a deep and, dark and everything like that kind of story and so i didn't want to delve into the like the psychological aspects that would probably plague someone who was literally stranded on another planet all by himself for almost two years yeah because if he if he was stranded on a planet with nothing to do then i can see it getting dark but yeah the fact that Oh, he had plenty to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like the fact that he has such an incredibly clear and articulated goal, which is to survive and, yep. and live. It, it makes every thought that he has motivated by a goal, you know? So, so it, it's anyway, man, I, I'm probably, I'm blowing so much sunshine or, or photons <laughs> up your butt, you know, that same thing, <laughs> yeah. but, um, okay. So without giving me too many spoilers, cause, cause, cause I am very intrigued about, <clears throat> like how somebody like you that has a piece of work at that scale does a follow-up. What was kind of your thinking in terms of what you wanted to explore with your follow-up book, the, the Project Hail Mary? Well, um, so again, my follow-up book to The Martian was Artemis. Oh, I'm was, sorry. I'm sorry. No, I thought okay. Artemis was, was, was before The Martian. No, no. Artemis was between The Martian and Hail Mary. Yeah. It just, um, people, so, uh, yeah, the thought process when I was starting Artemis was like, I got to follow up The Martian, which is probably going to be my most successful book that I ever make. So mm -hmm. my objective was, I'm not trying to make the great American novel here. I want to make a science fiction book that people read. And when, they are, when they're done, they think, that was cool. It doesn't have to be better <laughs> than The Martian. You know, it just has to be good. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what happened. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't want to go too much on Ar Artemis because I guess you, you, that's that not what you're, just in you have read it and that, that's right, fine. Right. That's fine. We, we can but, do a follow up um, episode after I read it and you can quiz that's me. Fine. I, <laughs> I, I tried to push myself a bit in Artemis by having a, a more deep and detailed protagonist. She's mm. flawed. She makes bad decisions. Mm. She, she makes mistakes. She's actually based on me. Um, Mm. believe it or not, because she's very similar to the way I was when I was her age. Mm. So, um, but Which it turns what out age in the book, what, what she's the 26 okay. in the book. Okay. And when I was that age, I was like immature for my age and also ostensibly smart, but making really bad life decisions and so mm. on. And so I based her on that, those aspects of me. And it turns out that made for not a very likable character. <laughs> so that was one of my biggest problems was that people, people, if they don't like the main character, 
you know, they won't, they won't argue. But anyway, when, when it gets it, what is my idiot dog doing? He's, Oh, he's hiding in the back and next to the zing. Uh, he's not uh, hiding. He's just confused. <laughs> he's yeah. <laughs> yeah. He'll be fine. He's zooming. He's, uh, yeah. 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 He's, 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 he's cool. wandering. He's, he's roombaing around. Yeah. He's room. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. But, um, <clears throat> but yeah, so, uh, for Project Hail Mary, I had learned some lessons from uh, Artemis, which is that I was like, I okay, see. like my character could be flawed, and he is, but um, he still has to be likable. You have to be rooting for him. So I, I didn't make him as self-destructive, as overtly flawed as Jazz was her name, Jasmine Jazz, as she was called, was mm -hmm. in Artemis. And he's also, I didn't want him to be a carbon copy of Mark Watney. So he's... He's got a different personality. He's mm -hmm. uh, he's got his own problems. He is again, and I I mean I guess the thing that I do is isolated scientist. That's that's what you could call all what all my books have in common. Mm. Um, although uh, yeah, so R Ryland Grace in Project Hail Mary is basically unlike Mark Watney, who for instance presumably you know, did a lot of work and hard, hard training and everything to become an astronaut and all this stuff mm -hmm. like that. Ryland Grace is a middle school teacher who ultimately ended up on a mission to save all mm. of humanity. <laughs> Krista McAuliffe style, rest in peace. No, uh, Krista McAuliffe did a bunch of hard work to become an astronaut. <laughs> right, right, right. Ryland After Grace she was selected. Just, right, oh, oh, yeah. oh, oh. Oh, 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 this one was completely without any. Uh, uh, right, training. he ended up. He he ended up. Um, yeah, he was. He was. Uh, he was. Uh, it, it's a long story, and it's called sure, Project sure. Terra Mary. I recommend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, I'm absolutely going to read it uh, because no all my friends that um, know how I feel about the Martian, and they feel the same way. And, and like, look, you know, we put you up there with like, you know, Neil Stevenson, and like, oh, you know, nice. like, 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 it's a, it's at that scale for us because the Martian well, was you. that good. And when oh. Project Hail Mary came out, they were they all rushed on it. I still haven't gotten to it, but they all tell me it's awesome. Uh, a lot of people like it better than The Martian. Yeah. So that's 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 I I never thought I would hear that from anything I wrote again, but that's pretty cool to hear. And, um, so and, what? Yeah, I hope they make it into a movie. They're they're it's in pre production right now. We'll see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's what I've been hearing. I've been hearing some some very specific attachments around with it. Yeah. Ryan like, Gosling. Know, Ryan Gosling, right, mm -hmm. as the main. So, you know, you, you have a thing for blonde guys. Um, I, I, I do, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, also, Ryan Gosling has the same initials as Ryland Grace, the main characters oh, that he'll be playing. So, Is I it mean, also uh, Fox? Is it another Fox? Uh, no, this one's MGM, which then uh, got – so they bought the rights from me outright, which is cool. Mm -hmm. Um and um, uh, it's in pre-production, everything like that. And then Amazon bought MGM, which has caused some a little bit of chaos. But uh, yeah, so we don't know where exactly where things are. And, and do you get involved with that process in terms of like even with working with somebody like I mean, obviously a damn you know titan of a filmmaker and Ridley Scott? Did you have anything to do with the script uh, with the actual screenplay? Not directly. So on, on the Martian, my only job was to cash the check, and I I feel like I I feel like I did that admirably. You know, I got that done. Right, right. But um, they they didn't have to involve me at all. They chose to though. Uh, so mm. when Drew Goddard was working on the screenplay, Drew, by the way, is also working on the screenplay for Project Hail Mary. So oh, interesting. Um, uh, yeah, when he was working on the screenplay for uh, The Martian, he was on the phone with me every couple of days to talk about, oh, you know, I have some these kinds of questions, some some creative questions, a lot of science questions and so on. Um, once it got to the point where it was shooting, uh, Ridley would occasionally have some questions for me. They would always be technical. He didn't have any creative questions for me. He Interesting. And um, yeah. So, and, 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 I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, that's it. That's, that's it. I mean, just, um, so like, uh, there were some random kind of unexpected questions, like, so just in the nitty gritty of the yeah. production, um, we originally had, uh, the Indian actor Irfan Khan, mm. uh, slated to play Venkat Kapoor. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, from the, from the book. Um, and so we had him all lined up. Everything's perfect. He's an Indian character, got an Indian actor. And then six weeks before principal photography was set to begin, uh, Irfan Khan had to back out 
because yeah. of a contract, an unexpected clause of a contract that came up um, on a, on a, on a Bollywood movie that he had been working on. Mm -hmm. And so he, he had a schedule conflict and the Bollywood movie contract predated this one. So he had to do that. And so then we had no Venkat and he's like probably the third most important character in the book. I mean, there's sure. Mark Watney, then commander Lewis, and then Venkat Kapoor. Hang on. Oh, gotta get no the dog. Worries, no worries. One moment. Yeah, you got to reset. You, you got to reset the Roomba. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So um, after Irfan backed out, um, they cast Chiwetel Ejiofor. Mm. God help me. I think I pronounced that correctly. I hope I did. And um, he did great. But they said, like, at one point there was this weird call where, like, the, the, product, the producers called me and said, hey, Andy, we need a new name for Venkat. I'm like, what, what, why? And they said, well, um, Irfan Khan backed out, and uh, so now we've hired Chu Telegia for, and he doesn't look Indian. I mean, he's he's a, he's a black guy. He's uh, you know he's he's not African American because he's British, but he's he's black, mm -hmm. and so you need we need a new name for him. I'm like Vincent, <laughs> and they're like, okay, good, and that's it. That's but, that's yeah, it. Click, like it click, was yeah, it yeah, was yeah, that was it. That that was the entire discussion <laughs> of what his new name would be. So in the movie, he's Vincent Kapoor, and <laughs> like yeah, <laughs> that was weird. And then uh, you know another time they you know uh, Ridley called and asked, "Hey, we want to show Mark pouring hydrazine from one container to another out on the surface of Mars. Would that work?" And I said, well, no, it would it would vaporize. It would just in Mars's atmospheric pressure would just turn into a gas as soon as you open the container. Sure. And he's like, okay. That was that was it. Literally, then, that's it. That's it. And in the movie, it shows like when he is transferring the hydrazine, he does it with like, you know, he hooks a tube up to one thing, tube up to another thing, and turns sure. on a pump. So right. yeah. Which is good. I mean, look, yeah. you know, and, but I will I, I do get to take credit for one. Uh, actual creative decision that was a proactive suggestion on my part Okay. that they went with. I said, like, I, I, I was the one who suggested that they play uh, Gloria Gaynor's I Will Survive on the ending credits. It oh, was I. That, first of all, that was a huge moment, right? I mean, that's a huge little button. That's a huge little signature to the piece. Yes. Um, <laughs> what, what do you think? First of all, uh, before I ask that, because I am very interested in that question, um, did you ever get a chance to visit the set while they were filming? They invited me, but I have a fear of flying. Um, and they shot it in Budapest. Oh, and at the wow. time I lived in California. Now I live in the Chicago area. And also um, I've, I'm much better at flying. I've got pills I can take. And so if that, if, if, if I had it to do over again, I, I would go. Um, but so I didn't get to go to the set. I would have been welcome there. But um, I did go to the red carpet event. I went to a bunch of the. Um, That's cool. The uh, yeah, the 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 whole you know, the publicity and marketing stuff like that. So I got to hang out with the cast and and the director and everybody like that. I got to walk the red carpet, and then later on, it got it got nominated for a bunch of Oscars. Yeah, so yeah. I got to go best to the picture. Oscars. I got it it got nominated. Number. Yeah, it didn't win any of the Oscars. It actually no, got no. nominated for seven Oscars. Yeah, it didn't yeah, win yeah. any it was of a them. Big deal. It was a big but it was deal. cool because I got to go to the Oscars. First of all, that's awesome, and congratulations, yeah. and you know, Thanks. definitely well earned. All right. So my other question is, what do you think is kind of like the most fundamental delta between a novelization and the adapted screenplay form? Like, if you had to kind of look at the formula required to sort of transform one into the other what do you think is kind of like the essence of that well the biggest issue it, it, so you're talking about making a screenplay out of an existing novel correct yeah the bit well first off i didn't write the screenplay that was drew goddard so sure 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 right, sure right. i know but you were but you know just like, so we're clear but yeah. um also the biggest challenge is always space um mm -hmm. if you take any book and you actually try to have every single plot beat happen you're going to have a six or eight hour movie. The only way you can hit every single beat of a book is to basically make a, a, a series like a TV show sure. or like make like a multi movie thing like Lord of the Rings and even right. Lord of the Rings skipped over huge 
chunks of the of the sure. original content. Um, and so that was Drew's biggest challenge was deciding what to cut. So, for instance, uh, in the movie, when Mark goes from the Ares 3 landing site to the Ares 4 landing site, mm -hmm. that's a montage with a David Bowie song playing in the background. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, in in the book, that was many chapters of him having constant problems. Like right. his equipment kept breaking down. He got caught in a dust storm. He was going to run out of power. He had to do all this stuff to you know, figure out where he was going. He got lost. Um, he he um, had like basically a car accident. His um, his rover rolled over like yeah, yeah. like an accident on the way down the, into Skeptor well, I remember that part it was a very tough journey it was an yeah. extremely tough journey yeah. it was almost like the heart of darkness yeah like, and like, that like was just like novel. montaged out in the movie right. but like you can't I mean something's got to go you know you sure. can't and, and, and I agree with all the things they cut except for one they got rid of my Aquaman joke I'm still mad Right. What was the Aquaman joke? Just tell um, there's a there's a scene in the book where it shows like uh, Venkat, who's Vincent in the movie, looking up at, or actually I think it was Teddy, the director of NASA, but whatever. He's looking out at, and he can see Mars in the sky, a little red dot, and he's like, he's stranded up there. He's all by himself. He doesn't even know that we know he's alive. He thinks we've forgotten him. What right. does that do to a man? What's going through his mind right now? And then it immediately it cuts to Mark, and he's like. How come Aquaman can control whales? They're right, mammals. Right, right. Doesn't make any sense. Right, right. And, it's, it's a great question. It's a yeah. great question, right? Because it's not a fish. Right. I actually do have the answer to that now, thanks to, I don't know, tens of thousands of alert readers who are also DC fans. Um, the, answer the answer to that question is that Aquaman is actually a very powerful telepath in general. In general. Um, he's not limited to aquatic life. It's just that's what he has the most experience with. So that's what he's more comfortable doing. He can control, you know, he can control a cow if he wanted. And in right. certain cases, he has mentally controlled human beings. So oh, he's just a very powerful telepath is all. Oh, okay. Okay. So that's so, why oh, he can control whales. Right, right, right. So, so it's all biology. He's got the ability yeah. over all biology. Any, anything with a brain. Right. Um, we're, we're getting close to our time here. You've been so generous with your time. And I, your... I'm sorry. I got to pick up the dog again. No like worries, I said, no special worries. needs dog. No worries. No worries. So right around now is when he uh, goes out for a wee and most importantly gets a treat. And so he's kind of asking about, about that right now. Yeah. So, anyway. so you moved from Los Angeles to uh, Illinois during uh, the, no, the last Northern years? California. Uh, oh, Northern I California. I was in the San Jose area. Oh, okay, so, uh, cool. city, Saratoga was the city I was in. And now oh, I'm in Winnetka, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. Oh, nice. What San Jose will always be special to me because when I was at the peak of my, you know, game developers conference type in time in my life, go to GDC, yeah. go to GDC in San Jose was like, a very special time of the year for us, you know, because oh. like we get to show off our new tech and the stuff yep. that we've been working on. Mana booth. Yeah. Mana booths demo my game over and over and over again. And then you take a break and you go around. Yeah. Walk, check out walk the floor, get swag. Yeah. Check out what everybody else is doing. Maybe sneak out back, maybe have half a doobie and go back in. <laughs> so, so um, to that point, not the doobie, but, but, but the other <laughs> point, what, um, what are you kind of up to these days? Um, working on my next book. I'm only okay, at the cool. beginning. I'm not talking about what it'll be about. I So one thing that happens with me is like, um, I, I can get a, a fair distance into a book before I decide this isn't working and I ditch it because I want to make sure I and like it. And like by fair, do you mean like hundred, like, like chapters in or like? Uh, well, the worst case was I got 70,000 words into a book. Oh, wow. For you reference, the Martian is a hundred thousand words. Sure, sure. So you almost did something at that, and you said this isn't it. This isn't. This working. isn't working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It isn't working, and I'm glad I ditched it. Although I did steal certain elements of that for Project Hail Mary, which sure. went really well. So, yeah. Um, right now, yeah, working on my next book. Um, it's I, I'm in that part of the writing where like I've done all the conceptualizing and it's awesome, and then when you actually start writing it, everything sucks. And then, okay, well, wait a minute. No, okay, let's, you know, it's, it, this happens every book uh, for me. 
So I'm, I'm working my way through chapter one. It always takes me like 10 times as long to write chapter one as it does to get to write chapter two. And do like, you outline the whole story or do you kind of go in order and just kind of like have the thought experiment in order? I have a very rough outline of like, here are the main beats. Like mm -hmm. it, it would be like a list of like five or six things. It'll sure. be like, this ha will happen, which leads to this, which leads to this, which leads to the end. And then there's the climax. Mm -hmm. And then I, uh, but I'm also, you know, if, and while I'm writing, it may veer off and I'll be like, oh, this is way cooler. I'm going to change it. Like, for instance, in The Martian, my original plan was it to be just an epistolary story, which means, um, for those of your reader listeners who don't know, epistolary just means log entries, right? Oh, I see. So in the book, uh, it's all log entry, this log entry, that. Uh, um, and my plan was for it to be nothing but that all the way to the end where he just managed to manages to, with no help, get all the way to the Aries foresight. And he's just waiting for them when they land. He's like, hi, you know. And that's a big surprise to everybody. But then I decided as I was working on it, I was kept thinking there's just no way NASA would not notice that he was still alive, you know? Mm -hmm. And so then, then I started creating the NASA segments and then it, then it, you know, there's all this, this earth side scenes and that it, it was a much better book for it. But yeah. like, so I never stick to my original plan. If I think I come up with something that's like way better. Did, did the voice, because, you know, for me, the Martian, for the most part, it's like first person narrator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, did, did Project Hail Mary uh, change voices? Like, are you experimenting it is also, with voice? Uh, all, all three of my published books are first person narration. Okay. Um, uh, Project Hail Mary is no exception. One thing I did in, in PHM, um, uh, it's, a, it's a micro spoiler. It's not a big spoiler, um, is um, it. Project Hail Mary takes place in kind of two time frames. There's the present that's going on now, and then there are flashbacks to what happened Historical? before. No, 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 no. Okay, uh, just okay. er, 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 like the main character, we start with the main character on the spaceship, and then we have flashbacks to the events that led to him being there, right? Yeah. And I, I decided for various reasons I, um, that that was the best way to tell the story, even though I really hate flashbacks. Um, but I did the flashbacks my way, which is like as long as as long as the story is progressing, as long as the plot is progressing during the flashback as well, then that's fine. What I don't like is flashbacks that stop the action so you can learn some bullshit about a mm. character's backstory. I don't like that. Anyway, um, because of that, I decided for the hell of it, and it worked out really well, to write the current stuff in the present tense mm. and the flashbacks in the past tense. Interesting. So, so the story is written primarily in the present tense. So it says like, I get up, I go across the room, I, I eat wow. a burrito, you know. That's cool. And, and so it was the first time I, I'd been wanting to do a present tense narration for quite a while and it, it worked out really well. Yeah. And, um, you know, like in screenwriting, which I've, you know, I have a lot of experience with you, you're supposed to write in that. The, well, you write the, uh, yeah, you write the stage directions in the present tense. In the present tense, and yeah. And also the parentheticals. Right, right, right. Yeah. Is there any way, um, do you, and you don't have to answer this, but do you own, like, the rights to create simul digital simulations of the Hermes and of the MVD and all that stuff, or, or um, no way? Fox so, owns everything. Fox owns that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, 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 it's all about what, yes, I hear you. It's all about <laughs> what is or isn't in the contract. And in the case for Fox, all the, all the game rights uh, for anything Martian related belong to Fox. Right. Because it's just like, you know, for me, less than the actual specific property of the Martian, which is obviously brilliant. What, what I love is your sort of creative process of, of having this incredible knowledge base of of engineering physics from your pops, your your own nerdiness, um, into what that can yield inside of a simulation experience. To me, it's like, man, that's that's some untapped stuff. You know, maybe I'll I'll leave you with that because like there's <laughs> well, there's a you. lot of cool stuff to create in that world. You well, know, thanks. Yeah. Oh uh, well, Hail Mary is. Uh, I think you'll find that even more fun. Cool. In terms man. of simulation. Well, look, I'm looking forward to that. You've given me an hour. I'm so grateful, man. You've been you've been so gracious with your time. 
I, I, I'd love to chat with you again. Maybe after I read Hail Mary, we can. Maybe, not, yeah, we could do another one. Yeah, but I can dig into that. Um, All right. So, look, man, thank you so much. His name is Andy Weir. His books speak for themselves. He is the man, the master. And maybe soon enough, uh, Ryan Gosling will portray another one of his uh, characters. That'd be awesome. Cool, brother. Andy, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. And I will see you soon. Thanks for having me.